The Bacon Shakespeare Manuscript, hitherto known as the Northumberland Manuscript, which originally contained copies of Bacon's Shakespeare plays Richard II and Richard III. In 1867, a set of manuscripts containing several of Bacon's works were discovered at Northumberland House in the Strand, the residence of the Duke of Northumberland, a descendant of Bacon's close friend Henry Percy, the 9th Earl of Northumberland. This special and unique collection of manuscripts, somewhat misleadingly known as the Northumberland Manuscript, would doubtless in ordinary circumstances be the most famous document in the history of literary scholarship and its extraordinary contents and significance known not only to every Bacon and Shakespeare scholar and student of English literature but to the rest of the English-speaking world and beyond to each and every corner of the globe. Modern scholars and students of Bacon and Shakespeare know little or nothing about this historical document and remain ignorant or unfamiliar with its contents, not least because it has been very systematically suppressed and misrepresented by orthodox Shakespeare scholars for the last 150 years. For reasons which will become obvious, it has never received the thorough and detailed attention its historical importance and significance plainly warrants. The five recognised orthodox Shakespearean authoritative scholars of the 20th century, Sir Sidney Lee, Chairman of the Trustees of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, J.Q. Adams, first director of the Folger Shakespeare Library, Sir Edmund Chambers, Secretary of the Board of Education, B. Roland Lewis, the World Authority on Orthodox Shakespeare Documents, and Samuel Schoenbaum, President of the Shakespeare Association of America and Trustee of the Folger Shakespeare Library, who between them singularly and collectively informed the modern Shakespearean canon, have had surprisingly little to say about the Northumberland Manuscript, where the name of Shakespeare is written all over its outside cover and whose contents once boasted the priceless manuscripts of the Shakespeare plays Richard II and Richard III. For 150 years, the Northumberland Manuscript has been presented as a collection of writings by different authors in an attempt to distance Bacon from the authorship of the Shakespeare poems and plays, whereas, as we shall see, its collection of writings serves as a microcosm of Bacon's proclivity for anonymous and pseudonymous works. Because when we realise all the writings in the Northumberland manuscript were conceived by Bacon, including the plays Richard II and Richard III, it provides absolute confirmation that he is our secret Shakespeare. There exists only one account of the history of the discovery of the Northumberland manuscript. This is given by James Spedding in the quietly titled Limited Edition, A Conference of Pleasure, published three years after the discovery of the manuscript in 1870. The information provided by James Spedding and John Bruce is brief and unsatisfactory. The account given by Spedding is as follows. On the discovery at Northumberland House in 1867 of a manuscript containing copies of some of Bacon's early writings, the then Earl Percy, afterwards Duke of Northumberland, wishing to have the papers in his possession properly examined, preserved and those of public interest turned to account, had requested the late Mr John Bruce to inspect them. In one of the bundles submitted to him, he found a paper book, much damaged by fire about the edges, though not so much as to make the contents generally undecipherable. Regarding the history of the manuscript, all that is known, says Spedding, was communicated to me by Mr John Bruce last August, and I give it in his own words. The story is related by Bruce in a letter dated 14th of August 1869, of which I give a brief extract below. 
Looking hastily at the Bacon transcripts, I saw at once some matter which I recollected as already in print. Other parts of them seemed new to me. I mentioned this circumstance at the time to some members of the family of the Duke of Northumberland, who took an interest in what I was about. I pointed it out as a subject for further inquiry, and at the same time directed attention to the oddity of the recurrence and combination of the names of Bacon and Shakespeare in the scribble on the flyleaf of the manuscript. On the top right-hand side of its outer cover of the so-called Northumberland manuscript appears the name of Francis Bacon and beneath it three curious scrolls. Sir Edwin Durning Lawrence first drew attention to them in his The Shakespeare Myth. The three curious scrolls are each written with one continuous sweep of the pen, which it would take a great deal of practice to succeed in successfully and easily writing. I myself am in a particularly fortunate position with regard to these scrolls, because I possess a very fine large paper copy of La Tenure de Monsieur Littleton, 1591. This work is annotated throughout in what the British Museum authorities admit to be the handwriting of Francis Bacon, and upon the wide large paper margin of the title page eight similar scrolls appear which have evidently some shall we say rosicrucian significance underneath bacon's name and the three scrolls there follows a list of its contents including the shakespeare plays richard ii and richard iii Beyond the pieces on its contents page, there are also another four writings contained in the manuscript not listed. On the other hand, nine pieces that are listed on the contents page have not come down to us, or in the words of its editor Burgoyne, they have been separated from what is left by accident or by design. On the critical point of whether by accident or design we would do well to pay careful attention to the knowing words of his great editor and biographer James Spedding, whose 14 volume Letters and Life of Francis Bacon are replete with Baconian Rosicrucian ciphers. The titles which follow have nothing corresponding to them in this manuscript but probably indicate the contents of another of the same kind, once attached to this and now lost. If such a one should ever turn up, which is far from impossible, it will probably be found to contain the following. The manuscript in its present condition contains the following nine pieces. Beyond the fact that Bacon's personal collection of manuscripts originally contained his two Shakespeare plays, Richard II and Richard III, its much scribbled outer cover carries a number of further entries relating to various other Shakespeare poems and plays. On the outer cover of Bacon's collection of manuscripts appears the following entry. Revealing day through every cranny, peeps and see shack. For all intents and purposes, this is line 1086 from The Rape of Lucretia. The only difference is in the poem Spies is used instead of peeps, with its straightforward reference to see the Shakespeare poem The Rape of Lucretia. With the invitation of See the Rape of Lucretia in mind, let us turn to its first edition, published in 1594, signed by Bacon with his pseudonym William Shakespeare, under his intimate dedication to the Earl of Southampton. The first two lines of The Rape of Lucretia commence with a monogram, a motif of two or more letters signifying a person's initials, used as an overt or cryptic device. The first letter is a very large capital F and enclosed within it are two other large capital letters R and B. 
These three letters re represent the initials of F, R, B, and the two letters commencing the first two lines, F and B, again stand for the name of Francis Bacon. On the final page of the Rape of Lucretia, when a line is drawn from the capital F through the B and A and con of its last two lines, it spells out the hidden cryptic signature of F. Bacon. On the outer cover of the Northumberland manuscript, immediately below the verse, appears the unusual word, an abbreviated version of the long word found in Love, La Love's Labours Lost. Bacon was absolutely fascinated with this particular word. In the Bacon papers held at the British Library, the word is written diagrammatically as follows. The long word also served another purpose for Bacon, who recognised its potential as a secret signature or cryptogram for concealing and revealing his identity and secret authorship of Love's Labours Lost. He immediately recognised that the first 11 letters of the long word possess the seven letters of his regular signature, F.R. Bacon. As will be seen below, Bacon used the device to great effect in Act 5, Scene 1 of the play as part of a double cryptic confirmation of his hidden authorship. Two of the other characters in Love's Labours Lost, Anthony Dull and Sir Nathaniel, were named by Bacon after his two brothers, Anthony Bacon and Sir Nathaniel Bacon. In Act 5, Scene 1, Sir Nathaniel, Anthony Dull and Holofern engage in a convoluted exchange on knowledge and learning in which the long word is introduced. The witty exchange continues in a passage where Bacon cryptically reveals that he's the secret concealed author of his Shakespeare play, Love's Labours Lost. Yes, yes, he teaches boys the horn book. What is AB spelled backward with the horn on his head? The Latin for horn is cornu, thus AB spelled backward with a horn on its head is Bacornu, phonetically pointing to Bacon U or U Bacon. The end date for the Northumberland manuscript is 1597, and it is universally agreed by Shakespeare scholars that the name William Shakespeare first appeared on the title page of a play on the 1598 quarto edition of Love's Labours Lost. The title page reads by W. Shakespeare, but if we start with the letter B and read up the page, it forms the acrostic Bacon, cryptically revealing Love's Labours Lost is written by Francis Bacon behind his literary mask, William Shakespeare. To the left of the entry on the outer cover of the Northumberland manuscript, by Mr Francis Bacon of Gray's Inn, is the heart-rendering line, laden with grief and depression of heart. The line is echoed in Richard II, a copy of which was originally held in the Northumberland manuscript to counterfeit oppression of such grief, and in Romeo and Juliet also. Romeo and Juliet was first printed anonymously in 1597. A second anonymous quarto edition appeared in 1599, with a new or altered title, The Most Excellent and Lamentable Tragedy of Romeo and Juliet, newly corrected, augmented and amended, with about 700 more lines than in the first quarter. On its anonymous title page appears a diagrammatical anagram of its concealed author, Bacon, and above its first page appears the Baconian Rosicrucian AA headpiece. In addition to originally having held two of Bacon's Shakespeare plays, Richard II and Richard III, the outer cover of his collection of manuscripts contains references and links to his narrative Shakespeare poem, The Rape of Lucretia, and another three of his Shakespeare plays, Love's Labour's Lost, 
Romeo and Juliet and the Merchant of Venice. This is the only manuscript where the names Bacon and Shakespeare appear together in a contemporary document. Various forms of his name Bacon and Francis Bacon and his pseudonym Shakespeare and William Shakespeare have been scribbled across the outer cover on around 20 occasions. They are, there are at least nine scribbled examples of Francis, Mr. Francis, Baco, Bacon or Francis Bacon. And his pseudonym Shakespeare or William Shakespeare also appears on the outside cover around nine times. In particular, above the entry for the Shakespeare play Richard II appears the entry by Mr. Francis William Shakespeare. And further down the page, the word your is twice written across his pseudonym, William Shakespeare. So it reads, your William Shakespeare. As if to emphasise this entry, a second occurrence of the name Francis is written upside down above the first Francis, thus reading from left to right Francis William Shakespeare. Below the entry for Richard II and above it for Richard III appears his name Francis, and to the left Bacon, and to the right of it Shakespeare. Below this, at the bottom of the outer cover, his pseudonym, William Shakespeare, is repeated numerous times. And as if to emphasise one more time that Bacon is Shakespeare, we are met with the possessive entry, Your William Shakespeare. Several of the entries on its outer cover are difficult to read, and more than a century after its editor Burgoyne's original transcription, Simon Miles has recently remarkably teased out the phrase in healing, a now obsolete word defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as to hide, conceal, to keep secret. So Saunders emphatically states the phrase in healing means in hiding, in concealment or in secret. This gives conclusive force to the scribe's message. In effect, he's saying that Francis Bacon is the hidden or secret author concealed behind the name of William Shakespeare. The editor of the Northumberland manuscript, F.J. Burgoyne, points out, As to the penmen who actually wrote the manuscript, nothing certain is known. The writing on the contents page is chiefly in one hand, with occasional words in another, and a few words mostly scrawled across the work is in two or more handwritings. This points to the collection having been written at a literary workshop or professional writer's establishment. It is a fact worthy of notice that Bacon and his brother Anthony were interested in a business of the kind about the time suggested for the date of the writing of this book. Several writers have subsequently formed the opinion, contraspedding, that one of the hands found on the outside cover, if we assume there to be three, is that of Bacon. On wishing to personally examine the Northumberland manuscript, Jean Overton Fuller travelled to Annick Castle and by kind permission of the Duke of Northumberland was able to fulfil her wish and inspect it in the original, a useful exercise in so much as she says it enabled her to make out a little more than can be seen on even the best facsimile. Inev inevitably, she was to consider whether some or part of the handwriting on the outside cover was from Bacon's own hand, a question which ultimately led her to examine for the first time several original letters and documents written by Bacon in order to compare them with the writing on the outside cover of the manuscript. Fuller says, I have sought for in Bacon's manuscript, promise, and in his letters, words which occur in the Northumberland scribble, copying out pairs so as to discover differences or similarities in the way the pen has moved. I have found in his letter asking a friend to the funeral of his supposed mother the word comfort to compare with Anthony, comfort and consort in the scribble. The letters are made in the same way and they share a distinctive feature, which is that the second O is very small and does not follow the F, but is comprised in the backward movement that makes it crossbar or rather cross circle.
The enlarged facsimile covering the section of the outside cover of the Northumberland manuscript, where the same word is written, leaves no tolerable doubt that the line Antony, Comfort and Consort was written by Francis Bacon, as are several other scribblings on the manuscript cover, including the three Rosicrucian scrolls scrawled on the top right-hand corner. As Sir George Greenwood suspected, the scribblings on the outside cover are such acts of ownership that the scribbler must have had complete dominion over the document, with the evidence overwhelmingly confirming that the Bacon Shakespeare document, known to posterity as the Northumberland doc manuscript, was originally the property of Francis Bacon. A document which included the first written examples of the name Shakespeare and originally held his two Shakespeare plays, Richard II and Richard III. The first piece still present in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript is a dramatic device entitled Of Tribute or Giving That Which Is Due, which comprises the following four speeches, including the praise of the worthiest person, Queen Elizabeth. It was written by Bacon probably to be presented by Robert Devereux, 2nd Earl of Essex, as key part of the celebrations for Queen Elizabeth's accession day in 1592, of which Professor Vickers knowingly observes, This accelerating structure is proto-dramatic and has some interesting parallels with Love's Labours Lost, written at much the same time and, in part at least, out of a similar rhetorical background. These nine remaining pieces in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript can only truly be understood through the prism of the secret personal and political dynamics which shaped and determined the relationships between Queen Elizabeth and her concealed royal sons, known to history and the world as Francis Bacon and Robert Devereux, the second Earl of Essex, ultimately surrounding the succession and throne of England. Their royal mother, Queen Elizabeth, secretly married her long-term lover, Robert Dudley, afterwards Earl of Leicester, in a secret ceremony witnessed by her Lord Keeper, Sir Nicholas Bacon, and his wife, Lady Anne Bacon, at the London residence of Lord Pembroke, which has remained an official state secret for more than 400 years. A few months later, Elizabeth secretly gave birth to Francis, who, because of the complex religious political landscape at home and abroad, which made it impossible for his royal parents Elizabeth and Dudley to openly acknowledge him, he was raised by Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon. A few years later, Elizabeth gave birth to a second child named Robert, and for the same reasons he was raised as the son of Walter Devereux, 1st Earl of Essex, and his, his wife Latisse, Countess of Essex. The second remaining piece in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript written by Bacon is given the title of Magnanimity or Heroical Virtue. No other copy of this short essay is known either in manuscript or print. The substance of the piece emerges in a more mature form in Bacon's Advancement of Learning. The principle of virtue, expressed in the words virtue, virtuous and virtuously, appear nearly 300 times throughout the whole of the Shakespeare canon, from the earliest to the last, written over a period of several decades. In his paper, Virtue is Not Boring, Shakespeare in the Moral Life, Professor Harp det details the linguistical and thematical dimensions of virtue that permeate the fabric and essence of the Shakespeare histories, comedies and tragedies in what may be described as a shared conception of the human good. It was by invoking the different shades of the accumulated meanings of words, as well as more recent subtle changes to those meanings, that he revealed the features of virtue. These talents help account for why Shakespeare retains his relevance and stature 400 years after his death. For his depictions of virtue not only illuminate the moral dimensions of the early modern period, but also speak to the moral dilemmas of our own age. The third remaining piece in the Bacon Shakespeare Manuscripts, written by Bacon, is another short essay entitled An Advertisement Touching Private Censure. 
No other copy survives either in manuscript or print. The date of its composition is unknown. However, its themes and ideas emerge more fully in his writings dating from between 1589 and 1593. In Advertisement Touching the Controversies of the Church of England and Observations upon a Libel, which suggests an advertisement touching private censure was written around or shortly before 1589. As with virtue, the interlocking themes of censure, censurer, censuring and censured weave their way on some 40 occasions throughout the Shakespeare canon. Aspects of the above essay and advert advertisement touching private censure were greatly expanded in an advertisement touching the controversies of the Church of Eng England, likewise present in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript. On account of his family background alone, it is of little surprise that Bacon took a deep interest in all matters of biblical scholarship, religion and the Church of England. Throughout his acknowledged canon, Bacon's works and writings are saturated with quotations, references and allusions from the Bible and other scriptural texts. He was familiar with, among others, the Latin Vulgate, the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible, the Douay Reim and the Erasmus Bible. He drew on Genesis, Kings, Acts, Job, Matthew, Gospels, Psalms, Proverbs, Romans, Corinthians, Ecclesiastes and a range of other books and passages from the Bible and other scriptural texts. All in all, the number of direct biblical quotations, references and allusions found in his acknowledged writings runs to several hundred, and when the final total is fully told, it will quite possibly exceed a number well in excess of a thousand as is the case with his Shakespeare poems and plays. There are more than a thousand biblical references and allusions in the Shakespeare poems and plays, with some estimates placing the figure at around 1300, drawn, just as with Bacon's acknowledged writings, from different versions of the Bible, the Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible and Douay Reims, the Book of Common Prayer and Book of Homilies, in mirroring his acknowledged writings in his Shakespeare works, which contain more allusions to the Bible than any other Elizabethan dramatist, Bacon made use of Genesis, Matthew, Job, Psalms, the Gospels, Acts, Romans, Ecclesiastes. He possessed an incredibly profound and extensive knowledge of the various books that make up the sacred texts. In his known writings and his Shakespeare works, Bacon refers or alludes to around 40 books from the Bible. It is deeply embedded in the Shakespeare works and it provides an undercurrent to some of the themes and plots, with Bacon dramatising its stories in the plays, often infusing them with biblical signif significance and meaning. The remaining piece in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript is a letter in the name of Sir Francis Walsingham entitled a letter to a French gent touching ye proceedings in England in ecclesiastical causes, translated out of French into English by W.W. W. It is titled by Stuart and Knight as On the Religious Policies of the Queen, Letter to Critoy, circa 1589, 945 words from which appear in Bacon's Certain Observations upon a Libel. There was another elusive mystery about the letter which has never been resolved. To the present day, no one has been able to trace or identify its recipient, Monsieur Critoy, leading Stuart and Knight to suggest a very plausible explanation that his name was part of a wonderful Bacon fiction, reminiscent of the letters he later wrote in the name of his brother Anthony Bacon and the Earl of Essex for the eyes of Queen Elizabeth. They say, if Critoy is not a real person, then we can start to reconsider what this tract was designed to achieve. Rather than a genuine letter from Walsingham to a Frenchman, it might be that On the Religious Politics of the Queen is, at heart, a propaganda piece that, as was quite common during the 1590s, takes the form of a letter and merely borrows the identities of its sender and recipient, and, in this case, translator. We know, for example, that in December 1600, Bacon ghosted two letters, supposedly an exchange between his brother Anthony and Essex, which were intended to be shown to the Queen. 
If this theory is correct, it would account both for the elusiveness of Monsieur Critoy, he simply never existed, and for the substantial dissemination in England of an English letter that should by rights have been in French and ended up in France. The secret triangular relationship between Bacon, his concealed royal brother, the Earl of Essex, and their mother Elizabeth, lies behind the sixth item in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript. The dramatic entertainment known as Of Love and Self Love was written by Bacon on behalf of Essex and presented before the Queen as part of the festivities celebrating her Assessor Day on 17th of November 1595. In the Hermit's speech in the presence in which of contemplation or studies, a fair description of Bacon Hamlet, our philosopher poet tells how the monuments of wit outlive the monuments of power. The divine verses of a poet endure the ruins of time, as would his own immortal Shakespeare poems and plays. But the gardens of the muses keep the privilege of the golden age. They ever flourish and are in league with time. The monuments of wit survive the monuments of power. The verses of a poet endure without a syllable lost, while states and empires pass many periods. This same dichotomy of the power of wit and the power of monuments is transmuted and expanded upon in his immortal sonnet of 55, that first found print in the 1609 edition of his Shakespeare sonnets. Not marble nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme. In 1 Henry VI, believed to have been written in 1592, which was first printed in the 1623 Shakespeare First Folio, Bacon, in examining the theme of war between England and France, as in the case of his device of love and self-love, places alongside each other the role of the soldier and that of the hermit. Written about the same time, the Roman tragedy Titus Andronicus, first printed in 1594, also refers to the figure of a hermit. In Love's Labours Lost, written and revised around the time of love and self-love, Barone, a gentleman of the court of the King of Navarre, the historical figure Henry of Navarre, was a personal friend of Antony and Francis Bacon, a mouthpiece for Bacon in the play, while speaking of the beauty of Rosaline, says, a withered hermit, five score winters worn, might shake off fifty, looking in her eye. As the play draws to a close, the spectre and striking imagery of the dwelling of a hermit is raised by the Queen. The seventh piece in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript is titled as follows, for the Earl of Sussex at ye tilt anno 96. No other copy of this short speech, a single page of around 500 words, has been found in manuscript or print. It is dated 1596 and was written for Queen Elizabeth's accession day on 17th of November 1596. The speech was written for Robert Radcliffe, son of Henry Radcliffe, 4th Earl of Sussex, whose grandfather Thomas Radcliffe, 3rd Earl of Sussex, had served with Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon on Queen Elizabeth's Privy Council. Very little is known about his early education and life until he succeeded his father as the 5th Earl of Sussex on the 14th of December 1593, from which time he took up the role of a courtier, where he came into regular contact with Bacon and Essex. In August 1594, he served as Elizabeth's ambassador for the baptism of Prince Henry, son and heir of James VI of Scotland. The following year, Sussex petitioned Elizabeth to serve in the Imperial Army against the Turks. When it did not materialise, he took command of a regiment under the Earl of Essex at Cadiz and was knighted by Essex in the field on the 27th of June 1596. At the time of the 1596 device at Stuart and Knight, he, Sussex, was closely associated with Essex, which might explain why Bacon wrote this piece for him. The fact that it is in manner and form similar to the preceding Bacon speeches in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript and carries all the hallmarks and style of Bacon, it leaves no doubt as to its authorship. 
leading a long and wide diversity of commentators, including T. Le Marchand Daus, Sir George Greenwood and William Stone Booth, to identify Bacon's authorship of the speech for the Earl of Sussex at the tilt, with the piece included by Stuart and Knight in the Oxford Francis Bacon Early Writings, published by Oxford Clarendon Press in 2012. The eighth remaining piece in the so-called Northumberland Manuscript is entitled A Letter to Queen Elizabeth Dissuading Her from Marrying the Duke of Anjou, written, so it is said, by Sir Philip Sidney in 1580 on the subject matter alluded to by Bacon in A Midsummer Night's Dream. From 1580 to 1584, the letter had a limited circulation in manuscript. It is invariably stated by orthodox historians and by his biographers that this private letter to Queen Elizabeth was written by Sir Philip Sidney. As with the Walsingham letter, so long wrongly believed to have been written by him until the veil was lifted as to its true authorship by Bacon, the letter fostered upon Sidney was also written by Bacon, which was apparently known to Spedding. The exacting Spedding, the most precise of scholars and one who was always very careful and accurate in his selection of phrase, says of the letter that it appears without any heading or signature, before Spedding states that it is commonly attributed to Sir Philip Sidney. His careful comment subtly implied doubt as to the erroneous belief it was written by Sidney, when in fact it originated from the pen of Bacon. On just a glance at the letter to Queen Elizabeth dissuading her from marrying the Duke of Anjou and other letters that were actually written by Sir Philip Sidney from the period, it is immediately, immediately self-evident that they were not written by the same writer. It is equally clear to anyone familiar with Bacon's style, language, syntax and turn of phrase that Bacon was the concealed author of the letter to Queen Elizabeth dissuading her from marrying the Duke of Anjou. The last remaining piece in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript, widely known by the title Leicester's Commonwealth, is arguably the most explosive and scandalous tract of its era. The copy in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript contains less than half of the complete work, with 14 folios missing from the beginning and a similar number at the end. It is believed that it was first printed somewhere on the continent in 1584, with a somewhat lengthy title, the copy of a letter written by a Master of Art of Cambridge to his friend in London concerning some talk past of late between two worshipful and grave men about the present state and some proceedings of the Earl of Leicester and his friends in England. The actual place of its publication still remains unknown, but the general suggestions put forward favour Paris, Antwerp or Rouen. Within a year, Latin and French translated versions, with additions, were circulating on the continent, now furnished with a title very explicitly indicating its contents. A discourse on the abominable life, plots, treasons, murders, falsehoods, poisonings, lusts, incitements and evil stratagems employed by Lord Leicester. More than 430 years after its clandestine publication, the anonymous authorship of Leicester's Commonwealth has never been determined. From centuries past, all the biographers of Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, and the modern editor of the Leicester's Commonwealth, wrongly believe the work was the result of a vast and complicated Catholic conspiracy, written by one or more Catholic dissidents to discredit and destroy him. Whereas revealed and confirmed here for the first time, the writing, production and distribution of Leicester's Commonwealth was actually conceived, organised and directed by the English Secret Service in a secret operation to irreversibly damage and destroy the Earl of Leicester, who was a threat to national security, Queen Elizabeth, whether she could see it or not, and several powerful individuals at the heart of the English government and intelligence. 
It's true Arthur was very close to Lester. In fact, he had known him all his life and was, as, it's, as is self-evident from the book itself, privy to private and secret information about him, either known to himself or supplied to him by Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, Sir William Cecil, Lord Burley, and the head of the secret English Secret Service, Sir Francis Walsingham. As its foreign language title indicates, the notorious tract presented a very long list of his alleged attempted murders and other assassinations, many of them by way of poisoning, and as a complete sexual lecture after other men's wives whose husbands he poisoned, as well as revealing his other clandestine marriages and children, portraying him as a dangerous monster bereft of all morality one who is wholly driven and consumed by his own seething ambition and uncontrollable lust for power, for which he is prepared to stop at nothing and nobody, including the poisoning and murdering of anyone who happens to get in his way. In the most devastating detail, it paints Leicester as the most dangerous of all threats to sovereign and state, describing the Machiavellian Earl as an atheist who is prepared when suited to feign and shift his allegiance to and from the Catholic, Protestant and Puritan factions, solely as a means of delivering up for himself the prize he coveted above all else, nothing less than the royal crown of England itself. Ultimately, these devilish plots and machinations even threatened the life of the Queen, whom Leicester secretly hated and placed in very real danger the safety and security of the whole realm. The tract was absolute political dynamite, and if the identity of its anonymous author was ever discovered, it would almost certainly have cost him his life. While the Commonwealth attacks in no uncertain terms the private and public life of Leicester, the author is deliberate and lavish in his praise of Elizabeth and speaks of certain ministers of state, in particular Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, Sir William Cecil Lord Burley and Spymaster Sir Francis Walsingham in the most grave and respectful terms. Neither the Jesuit priest Robert Parsons or any of the so-called Catholic Party in exile put forward for the last 400 years as candidates for the authorship of Leicester's Commonwealth contributed a single word, not even a single syllable to it, and what links and connections some of them might or might not have had with the printing, publication and distribution of the work was without their knowledge an operation directed by others. The intelligence operation was organised and directed by spymaster Sir Francis Walsingham, head of the English Secret Service, Chief Minister of State Sir William Cecil, whose brother-in-law, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, had recently died in very curious and suspicious circumstances, and the concealed author of Leicester's Commonwealth, Francis Bacon. It is no coincidence that an incomplete copy of Leicester's Commonwealth is found among the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript that originally contained copies of his two Shakespeare plays, Richard II and Richard III, whose thrust for the crown of England, not unlike that of Leicester, involved him in schemes, plots and murdering everybody that stood in his way. The tract takes the form of a dialogue between three disputants, a Cambridge teacher, Bacon attended Trinity College, Cambridge, a Catholic lawyer, Bacon was then training as a lawyer at Gray's Inn, and a London gentleman, <clears throat> Bacon was leading the life of a London gentleman, in which through these three disputants, Bacon discusses themes of religious tolerance, the royal succession in the form of Mary, Queen of Scots, and for which it is almost entirely remembered its key political theme of national security in the person of Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, who would stop at nothing in his pursuit of the crown. Decades later, Bacon would employ the same dialogue device in his little-known and even less studied tract entitled Advertisement Touching a Holy War. In addition to these three major themes, the tract includes lengthy legal arguments which strongly points to its author being a lawyer. 
His father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, was Lord Keeper and de facto Lord Chancellor of England, and at the time of his authorship of the Commonwealth, Bacon was the rising star of Gray's Inn, who later occupied all the key legal offices of state, Solicitor General, Attorney General, Lord Keeper and Lord Chancellor of England. Shortly after the publication of Leicester's Commonwealth in August or September 1584, which repeatedly displayed respect and reverence to Queen Elizabeth and a plea for religious, to religious tolerance, Bacon wrote another tract entitled A Letter of Advice to Queen Elizabeth, couched in terms of respect and reverence for its recipient, also with a running theme of religious tolerance. The Baconian Shakespearean content and style of Leicester's Commonwealth is a marked characteristic of its vivid and dramatic writing, with its rhythmic and pulsating flights of rhetoric, its cast of characters and the in inevitable tragedy brought about by the human vices of ambition, treachery and murder. The tract undoubtedly represents a drama of Shakespearean proportions, with its central villain Leicester, many of whose vile and repugnant personality traits are refracted through the amoral Aaron in Titus Andronicus, the titular character of Richard III, the two pr protagonists of Macbeth, both Cornwall and Edmund in King Lear, and King Claudius in Hamlet. In the tract itself, the English kings of Edward III, Richard II, Henry IV, Henry V, Henry VI, Edward IV, Edward V, Richard III and Henry VIII all make an appearance, the very monarchs that are the titular and central characters of the Shakespeare English history plays. In addition to this, there are numerous other historical figures that feature in the pages of Leicester's Commonwealth, who also feature in the Shakespeare English history plays that are just simply too long to list. Then there is Marcus Brutus and Julius Caesar from the Shakespeare play of the same name, as well as Augustus Caesar and Pompey the Great, characters in both Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra, Alexander the Great referred to in Hamlet, and of course the historical figures of Queen Elizabeth and Mary Queen of Scots who haunt the Shakespeare canon. Most of all, the story of the Earl of Leicester and Leicester's Commonwealth is refracted and told in the greatest drama in the Shakespeare canon, the tragedy of the Hamlet. Behind its dramatis personae lies the key historical figures of Francis Tudor Bacon, the concealed Prince of Wales, Prince Hamlet, Queen Elizabeth Tudor, Queen Gertrude, and her secret husband, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, King Claudius. Their other concealed son, Robert Tudor Devereux, the second Earl of Essex, Laertes, Sir Nicholas Bacon, the ghost of old Hamlet, and Sir William Cecil, Polonius. It is a play about revenge, murder and death, one overshadowed by the poisoning of old Hamlet, Sir Nicholas Bacon, by Claudius, Leicester. With the poisoning of Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Laertes and Hamlet himself, and by other foul means the deaths of Polonius, Ophelia and the two state spies, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, in the like manner of the numerous vile poisonings and murders in Leicester's Commonwealth. The Bacon Shakespeare manuscript in its present condition contains the following nine pieces, all of which we now know were written by Francis Bacon. Not only are all the pieces still present in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript written by Francis Bacon, but they are all demonstrably linked to a significant number of his Shakespeare plays. In part two, we will turn our attention to the eight missing writings, which were also once present in the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript, including Bacon's two Shakespeare plays, Richard II and Richard III, and the links of these writings to various other plays in the Shakespeare canon. <laughs>